So welcome to this episode of the Asthma Spotlight podcast, and I'm delighted this week to be joined by Beverly Bostock, who's a specialist nurse who um, I've known for a long, long time. Let's start by you uh, introducing yourself and telling us a bit about yourself. Absolutely, yeah. So I am uh, Beverly Bostock, and I work as a, an, a, basically an advanced nurse practitioner in long-term conditions. Um, and I started off with my uh, first love as being respiratory care, and that's continued through my career. So although now I do some diabetes and cardiovascular uh, care, the, the the way I started out was actually in respiratory care. Um, so I also am the chair of the Respiratory Diseases Committee for the Association of Respiratory Nurses, and I sit on the Primary Care Respiratory Society Executive Committee. So lots of respiratory interest. Wonderful. Okay, so so t- tell us um, how, how you first got interested in asthma and how you started out your work um, as a, as an asthma nurse, an asthma specialist nurse. So I, when I qualified, I qualified at St George's Hospital in um, London. And um, while I was out with the district nurse one day during my training, I noticed in a general practice that we visited that there was a, a nurse there called a practice nurse. And I asked about what they did. And the district nurse explained that they had their own list and they were responsible for their own patients. And I thought that sounded like a wonderful, a very autonomous sort of role. So very, very quickly after I'd qualified, I managed to secure myself a, a post in general practice where I started off doing the things that practice nurses do, like um, travel vaccinations, baby immunizations, smear tests, dressings, those sorts of things. But then after a few years, one of my GPs said to me, we'd like you to look at doing some um, clinics for people with conditions uh, such as asthma. So would you be prepared to set up a clinic and see people with asthma and review them and uh, support them uh, with their their asthma self-management? And I was really excited at this prospect, but by the same token, I was also aware that I had no experience of of asthma care. Obviously, I'd seen people with asthma in hospital, but they were people who had had asthma attacks. And that was not really what standard asthma care should look like. So I decided I needed some education and training. I needed some mentorship. I needed to get involved with people who knew a lot about this condition and could support me through my learning journey so that I could then support people living with asthma uh, with theirs. Um, And so that's what I did. I went off and I started off doing, uh, it was called the asthma diploma in those days. Strictly speaking, it wasn't a diploma, but everyone referred to it as the asthma diploma over in Stratford-upon-Avon, lovely place to do your learning. Uh, And then I moved on and eventually did um, a master's degree in respiratory care, which um, was a while ago now, but I've continued to top up with lots of other learning. And and I'm just starting out on my uh, PhD in adolescent asthma as of this very month. So another long road of learning ahead, never stops. (laughs) Oh, well, well. That's very nice to hear and uh, uh, delighted that you are continuing to learn. Of course, just for our for our listeners, um, the course that you're talking about was started by a nurse called Greta Barnes um, in Stratford uh, in the late 80s. And at that stage, only about 3% of children were diagnosed with asthma and general practitioners um, weren't really very responsible for asthma care. Most of the asthma care was being done in hospitals. And what happened with these courses that Greta Barnes was running was that um, we had a, a large number of nurses with special training in asthma who were running asthma clinics in general practices in the United Kingdom. And that training was actually extended worldwide where um, nurses all over the world were being trained by Greta Barnes's teams. And so today, things have changed quite a lot, Bev. Um, um, how, how do you see um, the role of nurses in asthma care nowadays? Now, I know we're talking about the United Kingdom, but I think this will be interesting for people in other countries as well. 
So from your perspective, what's happening in the United Kingdom? And do you know what's happening in other countries with regard to nurse involvement in asthma care? So I think it varies worldwide. I mean, I've often been quite struck if I've been abroad um, to see the difference, huge variation between countries in terms of, of how nurses are involved in providing care, diagnosis, management, um, discharging from hospital and that sort of thing. And it does vary quite a lot. But I think it increasingly, I belong, I belong to a, an international coalition of respiratory nurses, and I think increasingly we're seeing uh, greater involvement with nurses in respiratory care. I think what's happening in the UK is that... Um, a lot of respiratory um, care is delivered in general practice. Um, so it has definitely moved out from the hospital. And really, people who are being seen in hospital have usually got more severe asthma with particular needs with respect to um, the drug management of their asthma. Um, and uh, so we have lots of people being seen in general practice and we have a, a formula that we're supposed to follow, which dictates how that care is delivered. Uh, and that's through the quality outcomes framework, which many practices in the UK follow, not all, but many of them. And it's supposed to be a set of standards to ensure that asthma care and other care is delivered to a minimum standard. Now, lots of us feel that it's potentially a bit of a tick box exercise and that uh, there is a risk of people thinking that they can just follow that template and they will be providing good quality care. And I think what those of us in the Primary Care Respiratory Society and in um, the Association of Respiratory Nurses are trying to get across is the importance of people having formal training in how to diagnose and manage asthma and maintaining that training. You know, it's no good somebody saying to me that they trained in 1993 and think that that's where it stops. Because as you know only too well, Mark, the way that asthma is managed now is changing exponentially. I mean, it's just, it's so exciting, the changes that are out there. And if somebody's trying to still uh, support people living with asthma in the way that we did things, you know, 10, 20 years ago, they're going to be woefully out of date. So they need the support, they need the knowledge um, that they must undertake that ongoing training, and they need the support from their um, employees, uh, sorry, employers to go out and get that training. Really, really important, I think. Yeah, I think I, I I think this is something that concerns me a lot. When I was um, talking to um, Gary McDonald, a pharmacist, a few weeks ago, and I'm quite concerned that a lot of family doctors in the United Kingdom are delegating asthma care to nurses and pharmacists and healthcare assistants who don't really have sufficient training in asthma care, and I'm concerned both for patients, but also for those healthcare professionals, because you've got a responsibility if you're a member of a professional society. I mean, doctors shouldn't be delegating care to, to people who are not adequately trained. And nurses often feel that they're, that they're not able to say that they're not competent to do something that they're being asked to do. And so how would you advise nurses who are in that situation of being asked to do asthma reviews and um, they don't feel that they've had enough training. I mean, what, what would you say to nurses in that position? Well, my uh, my second master's degree is in medical ethics and law. So obviously I'm going to have quite a firm opinion here. And you're absolutely right. There's a, there's a double whammy going on here. Um, GPs shouldn't be delegating responsibility for any care to any individual who is not adequately trained. So they, they must realise that they have a medico-legal as well as an ethical responsibility to make sure that the patients on their list are getting good quality evidence-based care. For the nurses and other people who are um, delivering care 
and don't feel that they're competent to do so, they simply should not be doing it. And it's their registration that's on the line potentially if they do undertake it. And, you know, one thing that I would say is that I do see, I absolutely do see um, questions on uh, closed uh, internet forums that are not open to the public, but where nurses are asking quite basic questions about, you know, what should I do in this situation and can anyone help? And so on the one hand, it's good that they're seeking that support. But on the other hand, you know, there is that real strong feeling in me is that, quite frankly, you should not be doing this if you don't have that that basic understanding. And the, the, the motto that I always use is that you don't know what you don't know until you know it. So, open up your mind. It's all very well going out and reading and, and that's really good. People should do that. And and people living with asthma should do that as well. They should be aware of what constitutes, you know, good quality care and what they should expect from their clinicians. Um, but but really going on to some form of formal training, that's when you hear stuff that you wouldn't have even thought to go looking for. Um, so that would be my advice. As you're aware, the podcast is aimed mainly at people with asthma. And what I want to do is try and prepare people for their interview or for their review that they're having with a doctor or a nurse. And to try and, and, and this comes from one of the inquests that I was involved in a number of years ago, where a, a teenage girl died from asthma, tragically, after having a lot of asthma attacks. And um, I noticed when I looked through her medical records, that a lot of her attacks came in the in the early part of the year, in the in the February March time of the year, and realised that she was probably having tree pollen allergy, and that was probably what was sparking off her asthma attacks. And nobody actually recognised this until I raised it at the inquest. And so, coming back to your point about knowing your own asthma and what can help people when they attend for an asthma review. Let's start with yourself. I mean, when you're doing an asthma review, what are the things that go through your mind? What what are the alerts that you're looking out for and the signals that you want to hear from that patient who's seeing you with their asthma? Well, I think the most important thing in any consultation is actually to listen to the individual. So I might start off by saying we have X amount of time. Is there anything that for you is a, a priority? But I think the the, the motto of you don't know what you don't know until you know it also applies to people with asthma because some people think that it's you know acceptable to have symptoms at certain times of year i can't i can't get over how many patients i'm seeing at the moment who are um on prompting and not spontaneously but on prompting are telling me about their uh, allergy related symptoms um because we're in the middle of hay fever season and uh, are trying to get by with just an, an antihistamine or trying to get by with, uh, on, on a few occasions, a, a salt nasal spray type approach and then wondering why they are really disabled in terms of their um, allergy symptoms, but also in terms of their asthma and just some really basic advice about the other approaches they can take, such as intranasal steroids or intranasal steroids with antihistamine sprays, those sorts of things, allergy avoidance, that sort of stuff. It's it's really basic, but I'm really surprised at the number of pa- patients who are, are like, oh, who, who knew? Oh, yeah, I'll give that a go. So that's a similar sort of situation. But I I usually have three things I really want to hear from people during an asthma review. Uh, And I I include this on my uh, asthma action plan uh, template that I use to work through with the person with asthma. And that is, how do you feel? How do you know when your asthma is well controlled? So I asked them to tell me about, you know, the what I want to hear is that basically the only time they know they have asthma is when they take their inhalers. But the rest of the time they are A1 plus, they do what they want to do, go where they want to go. Asthma doesn't impact on their day to day life. That's the dream. Um, the second question is what 
what happens when your asthma is less well controlled. So what do you notice? And it might be for some people that they see changes in peak flow readings, but not everyone does peak flow readings. So it m more likely is, you know, I find that I might start to wake at night or early in the morning or that I can't go for my run without having to take my inhaler or, you know, any, anything like that. I just need to hear what they're telling me about how they know their asthma is not so well controlled. And then my final question is, what do you do about it? Because I want to know that people are very well um, equipped to deal with an increase in symptoms, which will mean that we potentially head off an asthma attack. And if during the review, I can hear those three things, along with it's always so important that we check uh, inhaler technique. I always say it's a bit like driving. We all think we're great drivers, but we're all making mistakes and we've got used to making those mistakes for many, many years. So actually being aware of correct inhaler technique and why it's so important, um, then I would say they're my four key points, really. Well, that's interesting. So you'll use that information to guide the rest of your consultations. Yes. You're asking the person what they know and what they need to know. That that sounds great. It actually fits in very much with the cycle that we use in the Global uh, Initiative for Asthma, where we we say that doctors should first assess, um, find out information, and then guide their treatment. And if somebody needs education, that's what you provide if they need a change in medication, and then review the person again after a period of time to see whether things have improved so what, what sort of things would would alert you that you need <clears throat> to escalate the treatment now you're clearly somebody who would be in a, in a position to be able to advise on treatment um, but for a nurse who's seeing somebody with asthma uh, what what should alert the nurse that they need to go and bang on the doctor's door and say this person needs to be seen right now well, this is important, isn't it? Because we both um, sat on the, well, I sat on, you chaired the National Review of Asthma Deaths, and we saw um, so uh, too many cases where there had been an, a, an alert and it had not been acted on in a timely fashion. So I think that um, we use the asthma control test um, as part of our review. I'll often send these out to people to complete before I see them. Uh, and anyone who's scoring, you know, that the maximum score, the ideal score is 25. Anyone who's scoring less than that, we need to look at why they're scoring less than that. And I would prioritise anybody scoring uh, less than 20 as being in need of immediate uh, input. Um, I am uh, a Gina girl. As you may be aware, Mark, I'm a big, big supporter, a big fan of the GINA guidelines, which I think really combine a scientific approach to the management of asthma with a very person-focused approach so that we're working with people who have asthma to find the best way to manage their condition. Because too often it's felt in the past that the people with asthma do things one way and the healthcare professionals are adamant it should be done another way and and near the twain should meet. And I think the most recent GINA guidelines over the last few years have really, really reflected the importance of people using the inhalers in the way that works for them that means that they are symptom-free for the vast majority of the time and that we really do anticipate times like um, the, uh, the the change in air quality that can happen at different times of year, you know, the, the changes in allergens that are around, the time uh, when children are going back to school after the summer holidays, when we see a big rise in, in asthma attacks. Um, and, and also the cold weather as well. So we need to be mindful of all of that and make sure that we work together as healthcare professionals and people with asthma 
to uh, optimize the management and recognize that it will need flexing at different times of the year according to that individual. So I think individualized care is really, really important. And nurses need to recognize that even if you see somebody today and they're really well managed and we don't need to go banging on anyone's door, um, we, we know that there is the potential for that to change in the next few weeks or months. So it's really preparing people and and getting them to understand when they have asthma that if things change, they need to act and they need to be clear about what that action is, whether it's self-management or whether it's actually turning up at the GP surgery or at hospital, depending on you know where they live and what their situation is. A couple of important points you make, and one was... You spoke about the uh, in the United Kingdom the quality um, outcomes framework, which is the basis, one of the bases for general practitioners' pay. And one of the questions that is asked is the asthma control test, which you mentioned. And sadly, the score is recorded in the record. But if the person doing the assessment isn't really trained in asthma, they might not realize how significant that is. And as you say, asthma can flare up at any time. And especially if someone's uh, ACT score, that's a symptom score, is low, action needs to be taken. Now, so from a patient's perspective, how can somebody get the most from an asthma review? So somebody's got asthma and they've got an appointment for an asthma review. What sort of questions should they be asking of the nurse or the doctor that they see? So I think um, it's a little challenging to do this, but I do think that people are absolutely within their rights just to ascertain the level of interest and um, expertise that their clinician has in this area. Um, And I, you know, if I go and have a haircut, I might speak to the hairdresser about how long they've been cutting hair and how long they've been working at this place you know and that's that's nothing compared to knowing that your clinician actually has interest and expertise in asthma so i think it you can ask this in a in a conversational way um but i think it's important that you establish that they have that knowledge and expertise um, and are prepared to, um, to to gently challenge, you know, even to approach the practice if need be to say, you know, do they have somebody with experience and, and qualifications in any long term condition that you might be being seen for? I, th- I think it's really, really important that people have confidence in the people that they're seeing. And as I say, from both perspectives, you don't know what you don't know until you know it. So you might, as someone with asthma, think that it's acceptable to be relieving symptoms, you know, three times a week, that that rescuing yourself from your asthma symptoms three times a week is, is acceptable. And actually, because it says so in some guidelines, it may well be that your clinician thinks that From my perspective, I always say to people, imagine if you were a surfer and you went out surfing every day because you love surfing, but three times a week, the lifeguard had to come and rescue you. You might be just questioning your uh, your surfing uh, competencies. And, And I think that, you know, we should be thinking in the same way. I think if you if you're familiar with something like the asthma control test then even saying to people to your uh, your clinician why do they ask that question why is that important you know i filled it in but why why do they ask about nighttime waking and and really you know getting down to the nitty gritty of the important bits of um the the questionnaire and there are obviously lots of websites available that you can have a look at. I think it's important to go to a you know a verified website because there's a lot of misinformation obviously on the internet. But go out, find out what you can, and then be prepared to be. One of my GPs used to call uh, people professional patients, and it was a compliment. It meant that you thought about your condition very professionally and asked questions of your clinicians in a very professional manner. I always like that phrase. So, I mean, you you started off by saying 
you'd ask somebody to um, say what's important for them, what what's the most important thing they're going to get out of the consultation. So somebody who has recorded their peak flow, for example, and brought it along, um, is this something that you find useful? I, I, I'm always interested to know why they uh, record their peak flow, because um, too many people record their peak flow when they're starting to feel less well. Um, so if they're bringing readings in, I might say to them, so what prompted that? You know, were you not feeling so well at the time? And then we might have a conversation about how it's good to monitor uh, you know, intermittently, because you then get an idea of when things might be going uh, uh, wrong before they go wrong in a big way. Um, I think it's it's horses for courses. I, I, I'm really keen to know, that's why I say to people, how do you know when your asthma is less well controlled? Because that's what I work with. So if they say, I noticed my peak flow started to drop or there was more variation in my peak flow between morning and evening, um, then that would prompt me to, to to talk to them about the frequency of peak flow readings and how they feel about recording it, but also to talk about symptoms. If they talk predominantly about symptoms, then I might ask them whether they do any peak flow reading and whether they feel that that would be uh, additional. So it's very much a collaboration. There's, there's no point. I can highlight the benefits of each approach, but there's no point in me trying to tell somebody. I'm not a great teller. Um, I'm not much point in me telling somebody they need to do their peak flows regularly if it's just not going to happen. We've got to work with people. And again, that's what I like about the GINA guidelines, that it really does reflect that person-focused approach. Yeah. When you mentioned guidelines, and I, I, I try and encourage people to read their national guidelines so that they've got an idea of what to expect from their healthcare professional. And the, the GINA, we don't call GINA guidelines, we call them a, a strategy yes. document because okay. they meant yes. to guide rather than um, tell people what to do. But um, if anybody's listening, have a look. It's genasthma.org, G-I-N-A-S-T-H-M-A.org. And so finally, um, if you, you spoke quite a bit about people not knowing what they don't know. And so if a nurse is asked to do an asthma clinic or to see people with asthma, how can they get training? I mean, can you talk about what training is available in the United Kingdom and also abroad? Yeah, so there are there are courses available for people in the uh, UK. We have uh, something called e learning for health um, or e learning for healthcare, and there are courses on there that are, are accessible. There are also organisations out there that um, th there are different approaches that people take. So some of them are um, academic courses where people have to not only learn about the condition, but also have to work to a certain academic level to be able to get through that part of the content. I used to work with the Open University on this. And so there are courses and there are open access courses through the Open University that people can do. I always had some concerns about whether um, it was necessary for people to write a good uh, academic essay to demonstrate that they are able to provide good asthma care. So I'm delighted to see an increase in organisations like uh, Rotherham Respiratory is, is one of my favourites, um, where one of my very good colleagues, uh, Viv Marsh, has put together um, some really excellent content around uh, asthma uh, diagnosis and management, both adult and paediatric. And there are it's a self-assessment as you work through it um, and no uh, big 3,000 word essays to complete. And I think that's encouraging more people to do that sort of training because too many people are put off by the idea of doing a very heavy referenced academic essay. Nothing against that. You can tell I'm a, a big fan of, of academic stuff, but I don't believe that that's necessary to show that somebody knows what they um, what they need to know about asthma. But I suppose the key thing, both for the UK and abroad, is to never sit back and think, that's it. 
I've done my course, I've passed, I now know about asthma because it's keeping the momentum going. It's recognizing that change happens all the time. So I think being aware of, you know, developments, keeping updated, looking at different publications that come out uh, across the world really to help inform uh, your your. Uh, perception of what needs to be done they don't always agree they often have different approaches so a reflective practitioner will take them all and work out the best approach so i would say whichever country any healthcare professionals listening in belong to then do find out what's available and you know you can often access courses uh, that are based in the uk as well as you said when greta barnes set up uh, the course the courses at the asthma training center and then monica fletcher took over we were uh, training doctors in bangladesh at the time and you know so so there there are ways that you can access courses in different parts of the world, even if you're not based in them. So lots of opportunities. It's just a case of going out and finding them. I don't know if you have any recommendations yourself, Mark. Yes, well, I, I agree with what you say that, you know, the, the business about writing a 3000 word essay. I think competency based training is very good. If you're asked to check in how the technique, make sure that's something that you can do. I also like to encourage people to ask questions and to look at the work that they're doing. And if you're running asthma, asthma um, clinics and you notice that people are having attacks, then go back and find out why they're having attacks. Did you teach that person adequately? Did you? So try and keep checking on yourself. A kind of self-audit um, system where you're constantly asking yourself questions and finding out what you don't know and what you need to learn about. So in summary, the key messages from our discussion on the role of specialist respiratory nurses are, first of all, anyone delegated to care for people with asthma has a responsibility to be appropriately trained. In addition, it is the responsibility of employers to ensure that those delegated to this role have the necessary skills to do the work. Now, some of the resources for nurses interested in caring for people with asthma have been discussed. And we also spoke about the need for people with asthma to make sure that they learn as much as possible about their disease. So I will include some additional resources on my website. So please have a look at the notes for this podcast where I'll put the link. So Bev, thank you very much for joining me today. I've really enjoyed our discussion and hope that it will be of use for our listeners. My pleasure and likewise. Thank you very much for inviting me.